So, Michael, uh, you may be aware, Francis Ford Coppola has a new movie coming out later this year called... Y- yes. Okay, good. Uh, Megalopolis, mm. um, which, of course, is funded just by him. Uh, and yeah, he's done it. And a real Tommy Wiseau. Mm-hmm, indeed. And, of course, there are some... Uh, uh, well, it, <laughs> interesting quotes that have come out about this movie today. Uh, so this is on Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, so he uh, apparently smoked a ton of weed on the set of Megalopolis. Uh, quote, he would often just sit in his trailer for hours on end, wouldn't talk to anybody, was often smoking marijuana. Hours and hours would go by without anything being filmed. Um, and so, wow. yeah, that's incredible. This, I think, is either going to be like the best movie of all time or the worst. Uh, I, I don't know. It's interesting. It's exciting. You know, which way is it going to be? Um, yeah. yeah. Well, the good news is he, he has done bad movies before. And that is always uh, nice to know. Because he did, didn't he do some like, I feel like in the 90s, he did some weird like family movies. They're not necessarily bad, but it's just funny considering who he is. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. And I, I feel like at the end of the day, if there's one thing we need in our movies, it's just a little bit of weirdness. Well, yeah, he definitely doesn't want to make a Marvel movie because, yeah, he wanted to... Uh, he didn't like traditional green screen because he said, uh, I don't want to make a Marvel movie. I, I thought you were going to say he didn't want to use a green screen because he was too busy smoking that green. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Select and Reflect, the movie review podcast where we look at films that have come out in the near and distant past. We give them a couple of watches and evaluate them beyond first impressions. I'm your host, Michael, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Luke. And this week, we are celebrating the release of, I'm not going to get it right, is it Furiosa, a Mad Max saga? Something stupid like that, isn't it? Yeah, the Um, thing is, um, I kind of predicted this, even though I didn't tell anyone. Uh, because, you know, I knew this new Furiosa movie was coming out. Oh, did you do some Rotten Tomatoes predicting? So, well, yeah, it's, it was the title. I thought, well, Furiosa, you know, that's too obscure. Yes, she was a main character in this movie, but everyone knows these post-apocalyptic movies to be Mad Max movies. Uh, and so I was like, well, they'll call it like Furiosa, a Mad Max uh, story. I thought yeah. that's what they may go... Like what Star Wars does. Yeah, Furiosa, a Mad Max story. But they went a Mad Max saga, which I think is yeah. worse uh, I agree. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> but that's yeah. the thing. I knew they wouldn't wouldn't just call it Furiosa. Mm. Well, the other thing that annoys me about that, uh, not to suggest, to, you know, introduce the idea that I've uh, watched all the other Mad Max films because you know that's not really relevant to this one specific film. But one thing that you'll notice if you watch the Mad Max films in general is that he tends to be like usually the main story is someone else's story, and Mad Max is kind of there, and he's obviously relevant, but it's not usually. Um, his kind of and of course that that holds true for this story as well so the weird thing about it is to be like oh this is a spin-off it's weird to have a spin-off for a franchise where the titular character usually isn't the kind of the person who the main story is about anyway that's my take anyway but the point is sorry we're celebrating the release of that film by looking at its uh pre predecessor it's prequel no nope, not that anyway whatever it was mad max fury road so luke why don't you tell us a thing or two about mad max Fury Road. Sure thing, Michael. Son just missed a one-on-one, by the way, for Tottenham. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Like, fucking mental. <laughs> that would be especially worse if the one-on-one was against the keeper. It was. Well, obviously. I, <laughs> I thought it would be a funny thing to say because I assumed it was obvious. So, Mad Max Fury Road is a 2015 Australian crikey. Oh, po- core blimey. Post-apocalyptic action film co-written, co-produced and directed by George Miller. Um, yeah, George Miller, of course, directed it. He wrote it, and it's based on the characters by George Miller and Byron Kennedy. Uh, I hope that is an Australian person, because if it's not, he they're is... probably all Australian. Yeah, well, the people who who, who uh, this movie stars, they're not Australian. Well, a lot of them aren't. No. Uh, we have Tom. Mel Gibson wasn't even Australian. We have Tom Hardy, uh, Charlize Theron, uh, who is kind of Australian, being South African. Uh, yes, it's interesting. She has an American accent in this movie. Um, yeah, I, I was confused by that. I feel like the fact this show is, or the, the, the series is Australian, is it's something I would, in, it's something I like, because you don't really have many Australian big yeah. blockbuster franchises. Yeah, um, of course, we all remember the 2008 movie Australia, um, which, yeah, that was another. We all remember The Inbetweeners too. Well, I'm just saying that was another Australian movie I, I remember, and I remember it because it was called Australia. Um, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, this stars Nicholas Holt. Uh, Hugh mm-hmm. Keyes uh, Byrne, Rosie Huntington Whiteley, 
Riley Kia, Zoe Kravitz, Abby Lee, and Courtney Eaton. It was released on the 15th of May 2015 in the US and a day earlier in Australia. Or maybe it was the same day, you know, because they're just obviously very far ahead. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Any- anyway, Michael, what was the budget for Mad Max Fury Road? Well, I think it must have been quite a lot um, because there's a lot of actors in this movie, uh, many of whom are famous in their own ways. And also the film must have had a fair bit of, of budget going on because there's a lot of stuff. I'm going to go for 80 million. Oh, Michael, you're almost less than half. Oh, you know what? Because I was, I was thinking, I was thinking, I was probably if I'd done anything, it would have been going low. Yeah. Well, you said it was a lot, and then proceeded. Yeah. You know. Okay. So I did have a reasoning for thinking it wouldn't be that high because I was like, but like in my head, I was like, like even because like the big Marvel movies and stuff, they have like budgets of 200 million, and I was like, well, they would have had confidence in this film. They wouldn't have had like Marvel confidence. So I was thinking like, you okay, know, give okay, them a lot fine. of money, but you know, whatever. 154. Point six okay. to one hundred eighty-five point one million mm. uh, is or was the budget. Uh, what about the box office? Now I don't really know this either. Um, I mean, they've made a sequel, so it must have made some money. But having said that, it took them a while to make a sequel, didn't it? Like ten years or no, 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 uh, nine years. Um, but it still must have made its money back. I'm going to go for four hundred million. No, oh god, five hundred million. Okay, well you were pretty close in the first guess. Damn it. Uh, three hundred eighty point four. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, three hundred eighty point four million. So, Michael, Mad Max Fury Road. Did you like this movie? Well, I remember one time. You know, YMS. Just say the yes YouTuber, or no. He said it was a fun movie. No, okay, yeah. Look, uh, yeah, fine. If you're going to force me into this binary, then yes, I liked this movie. Did you like this movie? Yes. Good over to conclude <laughs> go on tell me tell me uh, i was just gonna say yeah so yms he he like he made a review of this movie and he kind of like you know sometimes every now and then he does a little meme thing his meme thing is that he kept saying how like fun the movie was and then in his conclusion he just kind of degenerated into repeating the word fun over and over again he was like this was fun i had a fun time i'd rate this fun out of fun i on rotten tomatoes i hope this gets fun fun percent or like he basically just like which is i don't know i guess the point that and that stuck with me is like oh yeah this movie um its main thing is just it's fun it's just a movie where so, it's an um, action-packed thrill ride there's no complexity well there kind of is but you know you get what i'm saying like i, I can understand someone saying yeah this movie's fun and that would be their main takeaway uh so was he being sarcastic well no he wasn't being sarcastic exactly i'd say he was being more kind of post-ironic yeah okay um fine so did you, you liked this as well and you thought it was fun yes i did like this movie and i also would would say it was fun yeah uh okay i i think this yeah is special really that's what i came away from it thinking like this is a special movie and it's not you know one of my favorite movies Mm. it's not a movie which i'm like oh yeah that's that's a movie you know i want to watch again and again uh because again i I just i like a bit more plot in my movies in general and this of course barely has one uh it is just spectacle uh but that spectacle is special it is special how good this uh yeah this movie is um, and yeah, I, I really admire what George Miller has created. Like, it's such a un- unique, fantastic experience watching it um, that you you have to just stand up and applaud, really, at the end, which I didn't actually do, because uh, that would have been a bit weird, you know, considering I was watching it on my own. But yeah, that's, mm. that's, how I, that's how I felt. And again, you may be thinking, well, if you call it special and fantastic and, you know, applaud worthy, how is it not your favourite? Well, because again, like, I appreciate other aspects of filmmaking, more so than these kind of movies, but for, oh, yeah, I'm with you. But for what this movie was trying to do, I mean, it knocks it out out of the park. It was it's like sensational, and again, it's pretty unique. You you would have to say among like modern action blockbusters, because of course, the the complete lack of green screen is evident throughout the movie, and mm. it is so nice to be able to watch you know just real shit happening. Uh, again, the the, the timing. And the planning in general, you're just like, wow. Um, you know, it is something really quite uh, quite special. Uh, and so, yeah, that's why I use that word. And that's why I, I did like it uh, quite a bit. So let us get into nitpicks, Michael. How many do you have? I have two nitpicks. Okay, go on then. Well, one of them's a lit pick, sorry. So the lit pick is that uh, I liked when Tom Hardy said, that's bait, uh, because people like to use that as a reaction gif. Uh, my nitpick is, uh, why isn't Mel Gibson in this movie? Uh, you know, because when you think about it, I don't know if you know, he was the original Mad Max, and 
you know, he he could still be in this movie. He's 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 like an, he he likes to do old guy movies where he's still a, ba- a, a bad ass. And I frankly think that he's being uh, unfairly maligned in Hollywood. You know, I don't know who who he he ticks off, but you'd think you know why why not have Mel Gibson shot for the uh, legacy sequel? I'm sure lots of people would like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, good point. Um, maybe he just wanted he he just really wanted to appear in Daddy's Home too. Yeah, well, actually, to be fair, that is a better movie, so that yeah. does make sense. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's there's fun and there's art. Yes. So, Mad Max Fury Road, Michael. Uh, let's get into uh, the plot of this movie. So, uh, well, the the plot. Ha <laughs> uh, Set in a quote unquote. Am I right? <laughs> set in a post-apocalyptic desert wasteland where petrol and water are scarce commodities, a woman rebels against a tyrannical ruler in search for her homeland with the help of a group of female prisoners, a psychotic worshipper, and a drifter named Max. Uh, do you know what Max's surname is, by the way? It's like Katakowanski or something. Uh, Max Rokatansky. Yeah, okay, yeah. Rocket, Rokatansky. Max <laughs> Rokatansky. And Imperiator yeah. Furiosa fights against cult leader. You didn't know his name, did you? Yeah, I said it was like um, Mascarpone Joe or something. <laughs> it's, it, does, it, it starts with an M and then it's Joe, I think. Uh, it doesn't start with an M. Okay, Start, is it... starts with an I. I. Yeah. yeah it, is it, it? Wait, hold on. A minute. Is he called Immortal Joe or Immortan Joe? You got it. Well done. Immortan, because it's a word that isn't a word, isn't it? Yeah, Immortan Joe. Yeah, he is immortal. He will never die uh, until he yes. until he does. It's just like three hundred. Yes. The, the whole movie again is just. I don't know how George Miller came up with this concept. Well, actually, we'll get into how he did in a bit. Um, but yeah, just the whole movie is like them driving cars and yeah yeah you said a lengthy battle more like a feature lengthy battle yeah yeah and it's a it's a post-apocalyptic movie with you know cars with cool gas guzzling cars Mm. and yeah it's quite a unique idea but it works for sure like that aesthetic of like these uh you know muscle cars or monster trucks in this post-apocalyptic wasteland yeah that goes that goes hard as the kids say yeah they Um, do say that yes and (laughs) it works very well uh yeah and i do think like what, what like of course there are a lot of movies which are post apocalyptic mm. uh, even one that has come out re- relatively recently which is kingdom of the planet of the apes can maybe yes. be be described as that i think this is like the post apocalyptic like franchise or movies you know mm. the mad max uh, saga as it is now w- would you say that is correct i think i think you you are uh, quite I, I i would think yes i mean obviously you know you're you're putting me on the spot a bit i'd have to really think it through um but yeah, I would say, I think the only other thing you could say is you could be like, well, what about, I don't know, the Day of the Dead series? But I suppose you said, well, that's not, like, oh, sorry, the, the George Romero of the Dead series. But then you've got the fact, well, one, does it really count if it's a zombie apocalypse? It's not really an apocalypse, more of a zombie movie. And two, you could be like, well, that's not been as enduring. I would be willing to say, uh, admittedly absent thinking about it too much, that you're probably right. And it, it's good. I mean, I I do really like the the way they take this premise of the world falling to shit i think you can actually imagine that this is kind of what it would be like because you know you've got the kind of modern technology that would stick around but without the uh social cohesion that we get from living in a pre-apocalyptic civilization i mean i'm not sure how realistic it is to be honest with you i, I think didn't you see the flame guitar i pretty I'm, I'm pretty sure it would be far from reality but in terms of um when you think of like what could an apocalypse mean it could mean like you know uh humanity becomes you know extreme in uh, in a few aspects let's just say and this yes. is this is a pretty extreme reality which could of course only be caused by an apocalypse um so yeah i i think that's why it has such resonance uh, because it's like oh it's an apocalypse wow things have gone crazy things have gone mad you know mental in it just absolutely crazy and yeah so this is the craziest it's a mad thing yeah it, this is the craziest outcome uh so yeah um and well let's get into the plot actually first and foremost uh before we get into the development they're running aren't they from immortal joe uh, hmm. mad max and furiosa and all the girls and then they decide to stop running and turn back and attack um and yeah that again that that's it and to be honest that's all you need um hmm. because again this movie puts the action the spectacle first yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm with you, and I think I mean there there are other movies. I think like another good example would be the movie um, Dread, which I don't know if you've seen it, but that's also kind of post-apocalyptic. I mean, oh, yeah, it's dystopian. It's not the same thing really, uh, but that's like another movie. And yeah, there are a few others where they're pretty big budget, 
pretty serious movies, but they they had the the cojones to just say, what if it literally is just about a you know a big action thing and you know there's kind of a few twists and turns obviously it's not just wall to wall there are some quiet moments but really it's just action 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 and the kind of whole movie as a whole is just one continuous um battle yeah 300 kind of does it as well but yeah and uh, when they when they do it it's actually really satisfying when it's pulled off and we, we like it yeah i mean there's not just a lack of plot i mean i guess this is this ties into it there's just a lack of dialogue as well um do you mm. know how many lines uh matt says throughout the movie Oh, uh, it's going to be so few. I'm going to guess. Okay, I might under guess. But I'm going to guess like thirty. Oh, yeah, I think that's actually that's actually the amount of lines Furiosa says in the new Furiosa movie. Um, Mad Max only says fifty-two lines of dialogue. Okay, yeah. Uh, in this movie, which is higher than your guess, but yeah, still not a lot. No, oh, yeah, yeah. And again, it's because the action can speak for itself, and this is George Miller's philosophy. Uh, cl- you know, clearly with these movies, uh, let the action speak for itself. You know there's no need for dialogue and really it you're right you're watching this movie and there's no need because the plot is really simple you don't need max and furiosa to have a lot of you know dialogue or conversations you know eh, you know everything is pretty simple and i'm just saying that really to contrast that to denis villeneuve's uh comments uh how, did you see uh villeneuve's comments uh, when dune 2 got released obviously talking to mad smack well i guess you didn't because you don't have, have you even seen dune 2 yet I still haven't seen Dune two. Why, why not? Well, you know what? See, the the, the one reason is because I was going to go with my uh, my my bow, as she's called, but she hadn't seen Dune one, and then I was like, okay, so now it's I don't just have to go see Dune. I have to go see, or I don't have to go see Dune two. I have to go see Dune one again. Otherwise, I'm going to be going to Dune two on my own or with my wife, who will have no idea what's going on, and she may not even even if she had seen the original. Uh, so I was like, this is this is just uh, you know, let's wait until there's a Marvel movie because they don't require any homework. <laughs> okay, uh, fine, fine. Uh, that that's, that makes complete uh, sense. Yeah. But yeah, basically, uh, Dune two got released, and mm. I, of, of course, critics praised it. But Denis Villeneuve c- came out with a comment where he said that, you know what, I I don't really like dialogue in my movies. I I want movies to be about again the spectacle, the action. You know, I want mm. the visuals to tell the story. Um, which again is a philosophy that many people agreed with, you know. And his movie does look spectacular, you know. Dune Two looks incredible, uh, and of course I saw it on IMAX, seventy millimeter IMAX, uh, which I mm. like to brag about. Um, but yeah, so you know he does a good job, Denis Villeneuve, creating this incredible atmosphere. But again, the problem with something like Dune Two not having a lot of dialogue is Dune Two is a political thriller at the same time. There, yes. there is a lot of politics going on in Dune Two. There is, or well, in Dune in general, like the franchise, it's all politics. It's like, you know, space politics, <laughs> you know, uh, with, uh, of course, I think it's, you know, it's based on a bunch of houses warring. So, you know, like uh, medieval England, of course, I think is the, maybe the inspiration or, you know, not just yes. England, you know, you have a bunch of houses with their flags and yeah, which family is going to be the king or which family in the Dune universe is going to be the emperor. Yeah, it's like, it's like a Game of Thrones. Yeah. And then you got the Benny Gesera as well. And yeah, you've got all these, you know, political machinations going on, which are interesting, of course. Uh, and then, yeah, you just don't have a lot of di- uh, dialogue. The thing is, I w- when I rewatched Dune 2 for a second time, uh, it's much easier to understand knowing everything. Because uh, when you watch it the first time, you're like, okay, why did that happen? More context could be given. Of course, when, when you watch it a second time, it's like, okay, I understand what is going on perfectly now. And so I don't really need the extra dialogue. Uh, but yeah, um, that is the difference, I, I guess, why I would push back with uh, against Denis yeah. Villeneuve. I think adding more dialogue could have made that movie better. This, on the other hand, Mad Max, of course, it's not about the political machinations. It's very simple. They're <laughs> they're, they're fleeing, uh, yeah, this this death cult, and then they turn back to try and you know basically take over the the home of the of the death cult, and that's it. There's, that's all there is yeah. to it. You know, it's interesting because I was actually thinking to myself, I'm like a, a right plank considering everything you just said, but I was thinking to myself like, you know, they could have just made Dune be set because you know how like Dune is, it's not like a Star Wars where it's a complete fantasy planet. It's literally set in the kind of standard continuity of human history where like the, um, like I think the Bene Generates are like descended from Arabs and stuff or whatever. Not the Bene Generates, the Arrakis. Um, uh, but, but yeah, basically I was thinking to myself like they didn't even have to do the whole going into space thing. They could have just had Dune happen but instead of uh you know being thousands of years in the future on a different planet it could just be thousands of years in the future in uh, australia how much would even change yeah. um so yeah but 
so I, I, I would be happy for Mad Max and Dune to be set in the uh, same continuity. But like you say, uh, this movie relies more on, yeah, communicating visuals rather than nuanced political machinations. Yes, yes. And again, Dune 2 is a very good movie. Uh, yes. But it could be enhanced, I believe, with better dialogue. This would mm. more dialogue or better dialogue enhance the movie? No, it really wouldn't because it's unnecessary. So that, again, is the difference. And that is why George Miller's approach makes more sense with a plot like this compared to Denis Villeneuve's uh, approach in Dune 2. Although, of course, like I said, it's still a very good movie. Anyway, uh, Miller described Mad Max as a very simple allegory, almost a Western on wheels, uh, which is true. Oh. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, description. Um, further, uh, well, we have some themes. I say the plot's simple, but there are themes, you know, within the plot. And of course, you know, that those two things don't necessarily, you know, need to go against each other. Plot and themes, but yeah, it's it's. I, I saw this on Wikipedia, and I thought it was interesting. So, further themes include vengeance, solidarity, home, and redemption. Home dominates the motivations of Max Furiosa and the Five Wives. His home was destroyed. She was taken from her home, and the wives are in search of a new home. I'm not sure that's necessarily a theme, like home. Like, oh, people yeah. people want to go home or find a home. Wow, that's crazy. Like, it's, you know, yeah. if you don't have a home, you probably want a home. And if you, yeah. you don't like your home, you probably want a new home. I, yeah, I think once, at least at least once before, we've had, like, a conversation about, or at least I've said, I think there's, like, sometimes with themes, there's, like, a difference between themes meaning something that a movie really Explores. gets into yeah, and has, like, almost a thesis on compared to when it's just something that is there by the very nature of the movie yeah. like you could say that harry potter's about finding belonging because he finds belonging at hogwarts but there's not like proper breakdown of what it truly means to belong somewhere yeah you know? i mean and people like belonging people yeah mm. like that in general so uh also the unity of these characters also harnesses a concern for family which is a common theme within miller's films uh what are the other films in miller's canon uh, I literally only know his uh, Mad Max films. Uh, Happy Feet. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yes. Happy Feet Two. Yes, good. And Babe Picking the City. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, and these, of course, are very similar to Mad Max because they harness a concern for family. Uh, so there we go. You, those movies are more similar than maybe you thought. And of course, we referenced Babe uh, last time uh, mm. in Revenge of the Nerds uh, because the the actor I forget his name. Oh, is it James Cormack or something? Yes, uh, is in Babe, and he was in Revenge of the Nerds. So we're continuing our Babe uh, references, uh, which is which is great to see. The streak lives on, uh, and yeah, themes of ecological collapse and moral decadence are also present. Again, is there a theme of ecological collapse in this movie? I don't think there is a theme. It's just the there is an ecological yeah. collapse. Themes of sand and cars are in this movie. Moral decadence. Well morals have declined i would say immortal joe <laughs> is not yeah. the most moral person um so therefore can we say there's a theme of moral decadence not really no i don't think so there are there are themes in this movie actually because i i feel like i'm being too harsh maybe but there are themes mm. in this movie which we will get into later just uh regarding feminism uh which i think yes that you know in terms of oh does this movie have themes if you know you have a point you have i like to stand on if you say yes feminism uh because of course Furiosa, you know she's a woman and immortal joe is the chief patriarch isn't he and uh yes Fiori, and of course well we he know uh, we know immortal joe has a bunch of uh wives who are slaves uh, well, a few a few wokeazoids complained. Sorry, no, not not the opposite. Um, heroes uh, complained about this movie for uh, for being too feminist. I remember that that was part of the mm. discourse. Yeah, well, it's. But a, I, I imagine they're really happy now. There's a movie coming out that's specifically about the uh, the female lead character. Yeah, this movie again came out before like you could really monetize. Oh, everything's woke nowadays. Uh, mm. 2015 was just a feat. Well, it's because Trump really kickstarted that. You know, uh, it was, mm. it was it came out in the before times. When yeah, you could have a few, you know, complain. Oh, this movie is you know woke or whatever, but yeah, you know, they wouldn't use that word, of course, because uh, that again word only came into you know being in the last few years. But yeah, uh, it was it was in the before times in that regard. Uh, but yeah, it definitely has a perhaps a feminist message, which we'll get into. So uh, the development for Mad Max uh, Fury Road, because of course, why why you know it's a post apocalyptic movie. Why have it you know be, be basically a car movie, Michael? You know. On the, mm. on the, yeah, a western on wheels. Well, George Miller had the idea of making a Mad Max installment that was almost a continuous chase. Again, I don't know how he thought of that concept. 
apart from what I actually do because he was walking across a street in LA. Yeah. Well, I remember when um I watched this movie for the first time uh, with my dad and he said, he because he at this point I had not seen the previous Mad Max films and he had, and he said he thought it was really stupid that in the uh, the original films, oil is a very conflicted resource and yet at the same time, everyone drives around in massive trucks. It was like, it makes more sense that they're fighting over like human beings and water. Like they seem to be the more important resources because you can just assume, yeah, I guess they have enough oil that it makes sense for them to do all these things that waste oil. Yeah. As opposed to in the originals where it's like they're fighting over oil, but they're doing, they're like riding the least fuel efficient vehicles ever. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that could be a nitpick. Maybe they've just found a lot of oil. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah. Well, I assume like, to be fair, actually, like once enough people die, not to not to get my uh you know like elitist uh bill gates thing going on population control but once enough people die uh the small amount of oil we have will probably be enough that you couldn't even hope to exhaust it yeah yeah no that's that's that's, that's the uh the, yes. the future we all want yeah exactly yeah so uh why did it take so long michael to well, well the last mad max movie came out in the 80s right uh, mm-hmm. with mel gibson so yes why did it take so long for a sequel uh, production was uh, postponed. Of course, Miller had the idea, uh, I think, in uh, 1998. Uh, but then production was postponed after the 9-11 attacks, uh, which caused the American dollar to collapse against the Aussie dollar. Uh, oh. and, our, and our budget ballooned, uh, said Miller. <laughs> <laughs> and also there were security concerns and tightened travel and shipping restrictions during the lead-up to the Iraq war, um, which caused issues with the Namibian shoot. Uh, but yeah, so... Then, of course, you had the issue of... Oh, so it was shot in Namibia? Yeah. Or, or, yeah, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, and then you had the issue of... Good, good thing Australia doesn't have a desert. Yeah, you had the issue, of course, of uh, Mel Gibson uh, then being too old and too racist uh, <laughs> to, to play the part of Mad Max anymore. So, yeah, then things got... Yeah, that's the thing. They filmed this movie, I think, in, like, 2012. So it took, like, three years to come out. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, let, let's get into it now, shall we? So, Mike Rokitansky... Uh, a survivor haunted by memories of all the people he failed to protect is captured and taken to Warlord Immortan Joe's Citadel. Uh, and yeah, I, I, the survivors who haunt Max, we never get an explanation. Um, yeah. But do we do we need one, you know? Yeah, uh, so I, it, it's an interesting situation because obviously um, I don't think we do. I think it's implied because he is pretty clearly an anti-hero. I guess I, in a way that was a bit weird because he's an anti-hero, but he is haunted by the survivors. Like, it, and I'm not saying that people can't be internally inconsistent, but it's funny because obviously you see him early on in the film. Uh, he clearly has no interest in helping these women. He just wants to, you know, at one point just steal their truck. And it's only because there's like a whole situation that he, he doesn't do that. Um, so it's a bit weird that he is haunted by these survivors. And yet at the same time, he's still completely willing to leave people in the dust to a terrible fate. Um, so yeah. I don't know. Well, that's one of the themes, again, which we'll get onto, which is redemption. Yes. Um, anyway. So um, let's well let, let's talk about the start because it, it's an insane start. I was like, yeah, that's how you start a movie. Um, Max gets captured and then he tries to escape and he of course doesn't. Uh, and yeah, it's it's an insane beginning and it, yeah, of course mm. it's the only action scene really. Which oh no, there's another one which you know <laughs> cars aren't involved. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a it's a it's very intense and yeah, a great way to start a uh, movie. Meanwhile, Imperios Im, sorry Imperator Furiosa. One of Joe's lieutenants is sent in the armored war rig to trade produce for petrol and ammunition. When Joe realizes his five wives are fleeing in the rig, he leads his army in pursuit of Furiosa. Uh, so yeah, obviously that's what kicks it off. Furiosa, she's being the feminist she is by saving mm. these women uh, from yeah a life. Of- I'm with her. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she was the Hillary Clinton of that. <laughs> Yeah, oh. she was the less radical Hillary Clinton. Yes, <laughs> and uh, I actually saw like a meme about um about it was like presidents and it was showing like you know how George Bush and Obama both got older and then it had Donald Trump and it was how he got older. You're gonna love this this meme and it was uh Morton Joe uh, okay. because you know yeah yeah because he, he's got funny hair yeah great uh, so Nux a uh, sick war boy joins the pursuits with Max strapped to his car and a chase ensues. Uh, so let's get into the world building now, because of course yes. the war boys are very interesting because the, of course they're members of this death cult, you know, and Molson Joe is the leader, you know, he's of course, cause he's the leader cause he's got all this water, but there has, you know, there's this cult that has formed around him. It is kind of like a Norse philosophy. Well, I, yeah, I guess they talk about Valhalla. Yeah. I, cause they talk about Valhalla and obviously they say lines like witness me when they're about to do something mm. incredible, which is a great line. 
Uh, and yeah, again, it's there's not really a lot of context, and maybe there are in the previous Mad Max movies, uh, but that can make it intriguing. You know, you can be you can be entranced by all this craziness going on because these people just live in a world which is completely different to to us, like Witness Me, and you know, I am I am at the gates of Valhalla, and then they spray chrome on their mouths when they're about to die, and yeah, um, I, also am I awaited? Uh, mm. Yeah, these you know lines. Which I'd, how how much of this is taken from Norse mythology, or is it just Valhalla? Do you know? Yeah. So I yeah I don't really know. I think um yeah definitely like the idea of like seeking a worthy death is definitely something I know that Vikings were were into. Um, the, the, it's interesting with the the world building and just uh, for the record, the, it, none of this. So the world building isn't really built up from sequel to sequel because. There's actually a quite a heavily implied time skip between all the films, even the original Mel Gibson ones. Um, but it, it's an interesting... What's the word? See, I want to say a double bind, but a double bind sounds bad. Um, I think it's a situation where it's good, and it could have gone another way, but it couldn't do both of these things, which is... Uh, the f- One thing I would find interesting is, is being sort of impressed by the world building in terms of how intricate and deep the lore is, the thing is, this movie can't really do that because then it would have to explain things and stuff like that, uh, which means it goes kind of the opposite direction, which is that the world feels very real and lived in and sort of like uh, it exists outside of the context of the film. Like you kind of feel like, oh, yeah, this is actually like there's other other stuff going on here because of all of these, uh, I guess, assumed cultural references that these people seem to have, which we have no idea what they're talking about. And I think sometimes, especially you know, depending on the kind of movie you're doing, not having loads of exposition can work really well for a film where it's kind of like, we don't know a lot of the the world building stuff and what it actually means, but we don't really need to know what it is. Like, I think a lesser movie would have a scene that explains like the the religion and how Joe came to power and all these kind of things, which uh, I think it wouldn't benefit. Like there there are other movies, like maybe for example Dune, where because the world building is really intricate, learning about it could be like, oh, that that's exciting and I'm interested. But in this case, I feel like this movie benefits from not really knowing about it. No, you're right. It it does benefit. Uh, I prefer it that way because again, this is just a crazy movie. So yeah, don't explain yeah. stuff. So there's no need. Yeah, there's no need for any explanation. Just yeah, if it's crazy, just keep it crazy. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it does benefit that the world is so crazy. Yeah. Because if it was kind of like, you know, again, I keep referencing Dune, the uh, more nuanced political stuff going on, then you'd maybe be like, well, I want an explanation here. But when it's just generally crazy, uh, what's the word? It kind of not really suspends your disbelief, but uh, allows you to feel like, well, I don't yeah. need an explanation for yeah, this. Yeah, you don't need it. You just get wrapped up in the movie, which is, of course, what George Miller wants. Uh, yes. And, and that's what all you need to do as an audience member. Uh, so, uh, and again, it doesn't really work to contrast it with Doom with Denis Villeneuve. You just want to get wrapped up in the atmosphere. Well, no, I mean, the, the politics and the machinations are a central mm. point of the movie. And again, this isn't a Doom 2 review. Uh, so let's talk about the action scenes, of course. Like, of course, the, the cars and the stunts, it's just so engrossing. Like, I, I just wrote out far better than Fast and the Furious. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, these are, these are how you do car stunts, you know. Uh, and yeah, like, I just, I'm thinking of like Fast and Fur- Furious 8 when it, of course, it's all CG, but. You know, you had that nuclear warhead, uh, which one of the cars pushes. Remember, remember that on the ice? Yeah, yeah, on yeah. the ice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a lot better. And yeah, when again, when they go into the sandstorm and the car gets sucked into the tornado in the storm, mm. that's like, oh yeah, that that's that's a shot. There's so many like cool moments, and I and I feel like a lot of this review might just be me saying, oh, that's a really cool moment. You know, oh, that was really neat to see. Uh, but that's all yeah, I got to say. That's valid. Yeah, as they say. Yeah. Uh, according to Miller, ninety percent of the effects in the film were achieved practically. Uh, both the Doof wagon and the Doof warrior's guitar are fully functional, and none oh, of his wow. scenes were rendered using CGI, even when the guitar shoots fire. Uh, second unit director and supervising stunt coordinator Guy Norris, uh, he better be Australian with a name like that, was in charge of over one hundred and fifty stunt performers, some of whom were from the Cirque du Soleil. Uh, and yeah, mm-hmm. it's just really impressive what they managed to do. Again, the, these stunts are crazy, and the guy playing the guitar, you know, it, it's the coolest shit. Again, what mm. what what an image, what a movie moment. Like, that, that that's just uh, almost iconic, really. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, I've heard a lot of people be like, oh man, that, that scene there of him playing the guitar, just, it sticks with everyone. Yeah, well, it, again, does it make sense for a guy with a guitar to you know just, while they're going into war to, you know just to be riffing does it make sense that in this post-apocalyptic wasteland all these g- 
gas guzzling cars or you know mm. <laughs> basically driving across like the desert wouldn't you why would these cars be be used if there's if oil basically you know is a is a resource which yeah is scarce it's a contested resource yes it's a con- yeah exactly do, do these things make sense no but they fit in with the aesthetic of the movie you know the guy mm. finding yeah yeah that fits in with what again the, the vibe of this movie is and of course, all the cars, you know, that fits in the vibe. Logic is kind of thrown out the window, and that that is fine yeah. when when you're watching a movie like this. So yeah, well, I think I think the other thing is like you know there was precedent for in like the olden days for you to have like a marching band when you're going in. And I I do one thing I've always liked about the idea of Mad Max, and this is one one situation where because I mentioned the idea of you could have more elaborate world building. Um, and if if I would like the idea of them doing more elaborate world building at least in one film, if they kind of did this, which is the idea of it's almost like going back to feudalism where kind of the the people on motorbikes are like knights and stuff like that it couldn't be too obvious with it because that would be lame but when you see things like the idea of you know they used to have marching bands like people playing drums and flutes and things because it was the middle ages but that with like a modern twist where it's playing electric guitars uh, i think that's like quite an interesting idea mm-hmm. um so i do like that yeah yeah no i, I think it is uh yeah it, it, you are right there that's a good point so yeah maybe there is some logic uh, in this, uh, yeah, in this movie with the guitar. So let's talk about the uh, uh, the. Well, yeah, let's talk about one more fight, fight scene first, or one more action scene. So, of course, Furiosa drives into the sandstorm and loses her pursuers, except mm. Nux, who attempts to sacrifice himself to blow up the rig. And of course, after the sandstorm, Max finds Furiosa repairing the rig, accompanied by Joe's wives, and then Max subdues Furiosa uh, in a great fight scene. Of course, Nux get involved, gets involved. He wakes up. And mm. I, I, again, that's not a, like a an action scene with cars. Again, it's just you know they're, they're just battling with, with a chain. But again, it's so inventive and creative. It's like there's yeah. so much effort put into that action scene. It was so great. I was like, they again, this movie is all about the cars. But no, even this fucking scene is so is yeah. so good. You know, and also, I mean, it, it's gritty. Like I think it's um, an, uh, you know, you mentioned the absence of green screen. And the funny thing is that it's not just that they were like, well, it won't look very good. It's the fact that by having it feel, by like not letting yourself do green screen and stuff, you limit yourself to the real world. And that means the action feels way more real yeah. and visceral because it is ultimately actually, it's not just a kind of people flying around with mo- mo- motion capture suits against a green background in a CGI environment. It's actual people rolling around in the sand and you have a reference for what it would actually be like. Uh, presumably they were actually chained together presumably they actually ripped someone's face off i know that's a later scene i couldn't think but yeah it makes it more real as well so not only is it inventive yeah. um yeah and also i think it helps that the characters are more nuanced in terms of what's going on because it's not just like a good guy versus bad guy thing a lot of the people are kind of out for themselves mm-hmm. uh yeah which i think as adds to it as well well yeah certainly max at the beginning that's the case mm. uh so yeah yeah again and uh it's it's good that things start off like that uh, because yeah, that's I think more believable considering yeah just the the lack of morals in this in this post apocalyptic world. Uh, so yeah, um, let's uh, yeah let's talk about the frame rate now. So uh, Miller recruited his wife Margaret Sixel to edit the film, as he felt she could make it stand out from other action films. Sixel had 480 hours of footage to edit, uh, which took three months to watch. The film uh, contains about 2,700 cuts in 120 minutes, or 22.5 cuts per minute. Uh, compared to Mad Max's two, 1,200 cuts in 90 minutes or 13.33 cuts per minute. So yeah, basically a lot of editing and a lot of cutting. And we, we didn't actually mention, which we probably should have, because we were rev- uh, reviewing this movie because of the release of Furiosa. But uh, Mad Max was, of course, nominated uh, for 10 awards at the 88th Academy Awards, mm. uh, winning six. Of course, it is, you know, I, I it won a lot of the technical awards. Uh, and I remember when it picked up a bunch of technical awards, people were thinking, "Oh, could it win Best Picture?" It it, it did not. Yeah, it did not win Best Picture. Uh, what what won in twenty fifteen for Best? I Would think... that have been Spotlight? No, Birdman. Oh, Birdman. Birdman was a good movie. Yeah, but, so... yeah, but, yeah. And of course, it's one of the greatest action movies of all time. And yeah, you can tell again the effort, you know, the time that it took for Margaret Sixel to go through all of this. So uh, yeah, according to Seal, who I'm not sure who this person is, but yeah, singer. Yeah, I'm gonna say he's Australian. Something like fifty or sixty percent of the film is not running uh, at twenty-four frames a second, which is the tr- uh, traditional frame rate. It'll be running below twenty-four frames because George, if he couldn't understand what was happening in the shot, he slowed it down until you could, or if it was too well understood, he shortened it or he speed it back, uh, back. Sorry, he speed it up back towards twenty-four. His manipulation of every shot in the movie is intense. 
Uh, mm. So yeah, that's that's what he tried to do. And again, the like this was filmed in 2012. It came out in 2015. Mm. You have 480 hours, and you edit it like so precisely. This yeah, no wonder it's called one of you know the greatest yeah. action movies of all time. Like the, you can't imagine like the again the, the the time and dedication going into this. Can you? No. Yeah. Yeah. So they yeah they changed the frame rate just uh yeah which is interesting because i know like with peter jackson speaking of people from australia <laughs> i just said that to annoy <laughs> to annoy new zealanders who will be listening um but yeah he he like famously messed around with the frame rate for the hobbit and it looks really bad but the other thing about the hobbit is it was famously uh, it famously had an incredibly rushed post-production thing because the studio was like you need to like get out like the lord of the rings like all, all uh, three in a row blah 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 so i guess it goes to show uh, because I mean that, that's the other thing with because I remember I did see a video about how you know everyone does talk about you know the fact this movie has much less CGI compared to a lot of other movies but it does have CGI in it obviously and the thing is the CGI looks good because they presumably had a lot of time to work like if they're spending three years just to kind of edit it and they're doing it right down to the level of changing the frame rate and stuff you imagine that in that three years they've also got a lot of time to work on the effects and make sure they're not rushing them out so yeah it's, it's just a testament to spending time on something really yeah which of course doesn't happen in the modern movie business does it I like spending time what no taking care what no like being dedicated and putting in effort no like let's just get this slop out as quickly as possible uh, yeah. which is why the movies that do stand out like are heralded and yeah maybe Furiosa will be one of those movies so uh, yeah uh, the Washington Post noted that the changing frame rate ga- uh, gives the film an almost cartoonishly jerky look which I think is true uh, and again it's just like a, a, a cartoonish you know vibe maybe like again a crazy vibe you know just look like what are we watching this is also weird that that makes sense again the frame rate changes maybe wouldn't work for other movies but it fits like a glove for, for this one mm. so max joins up with furiosa and the wives uh, and furiosa drives through a canyon controlled by a biker gang uh of course the gang turns on her because she arranged for safe passage uh, but they spot an army approaching and joe catches up with them and while helping max uh <laughs> i'll give you 10 points if you guess the uh, uh the name of, or guess know the name of the wife that dies uh uh, Ariel. It's Angharad. Angharad, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fa- That's a beautiful name. Uh, yeah, falls off the rig and is fatally run over by Joe, who uh, halts his pursuits. Uh, the movie, of course, yeah, I just put, it never stops. Like, you think it'll slow down, but it just doesn't. And, like, the first hour is a massive car chase, I put, like, on the second, like, <laughs> then there's 30 minutes at the end, which is just a car chase. But, yeah, it's like, mm. oh, yeah, you know, oh, Mad Max is, you know, he's he's in the desert and he's, you know, he has an action scene where he manages to take control of this oil rig. Oh, sorry, not the rig. Uh, sorry, not an oil rig, just the rig. Mm. Uh, and then it's, like, oh, yeah, now we have a, another car chase, like, 10 minutes later. It's, it's yeah, it, this movie is fast-paced, isn't it? Which, again, fits in with the, uh, what, what's happening on, on the screen, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think also it's not actually... So I think a something that an, a pleb might think is that, well, obviously, if you just make a movie wall-to-wall action, it will be entertaining. But of course, in reality, that's not true. Uh, action can get boring quite easily, like with that really long Anakin and Obi-Wan fight in you know, Star Wars. So it's not as if it's just like, well, there's loads of action, so obviously it's exciting. Uh, I think making a car chase that you think about like you say like how much of this the runtime of this film is car chases it's like 40 minutes 50 minutes a lot of it is just a car chase making that uh last that long without feeling tedious is uh, really impressive and shows a lot of skill no you're right uh, I-, I was surprised at how it keeps going but again the-, the action is insane the visuals are all insane like again it's really cool so you're never like wow i can't wait for this to end so uh let's talk about nooks now michael uh played mm. by nicholas holtz uh, who is going to be playing another bold character soon, of course. Um, I, I don't know. Is, is he, has he been charged, cast as Professor X? Uh, Lex Luthor. Oh, Lex Luthor. Okay, yeah, that's fun. So, uh, Capable, which is one of the wives, uh, finds Nooks hiding in the rig and consoles him as he laments his failure. Uh, later on, the rig gets stuck in the mud and Nooks emerges to help free it, joining the crew. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about Nooks because he is an interesting character. Uh, mm. A war boy who's part of this death cult who has shown he is wrong, and I think that's a great choice to have him in this movie, because uh, yeah, he's just yeah. he's just like this movie could have worked without him, really. But George Miller was like, "No, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this character in. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know make it make it a bit interesting, and I think it also ties in with, with the themes as well." 
uh, of the movie. But yeah, I just think in general, I'm, I'm glad this character was in this movie, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think like the one thing you could say is that like his his change is you'd think it's underdeveloped simply because but the things you don't really have like much context but it's like obviously if it is literally his religion it's a bit weird that he changes so rapidly um yeah i, I was don't gonna, think it massively matters but I, well i was gonna bring that up next so yes thank okay you for, yeah good yes i'm bringing that up but yeah i was just wanting to make the point his character is interesting but yeah he is yeah he's yeah. interesting yeah. but yeah uh, i do wonder whether the switch like you to being redeemed happened too quickly yeah mm. like it, it, it is his religion but maybe it, it, all it takes is just one hot girl that talks to him and that's it you know gives yeah. gives him a, gives him a kiss and he's like oh okay i'll, I'll drop everything now now i am yeah. a, now i'm no longer a war boy maybe yeah, that's I, it. I, yeah i mean for all we know maybe there's some like because things it seems like the big thing is that he it's kind of a funny scene he's like gets really hyped up about you know sacrificing and like there's a place waiting for him in valhalla or something and then he like he trips or i think he like his uh, there's a chain and it gets caught and then uh smoky joe's like pathetic and like i guess maybe uh that moment is the reason because that's obviously what happens immediately before he kind of changes yeah. so you could be like well maybe he he like that was so traumatic to him that he had to abandon his religion because he yeah. realized he was too much of a little baby boy to make it to valhalla yeah it's such a crushing moment but then to switch sides yeah that's the it's like okay maybe he's given up but then to switch and go against this religion well that's that's mm. crazy really in such a short period of time uh, so maybe that could be in a nitpick but anyway uh, after dark furious and max slow joe's forces with mines in a swamp land but joe's ally the bullet farmer continues the pursuit Fur- furious blinds the approaching bullet farmer uh, and max confronts him and returns with guns and ammunition you know with blood oh uh, 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 aren't you aren't you injured it's it's not his blood no it's furious who says that so yes yeah <laughs> in her american voice yeah that's not his blood dude yeah the pace is just ridiculous again we're, we're, and and like the the blind guy shooting in the dark it just looks so cool and that's the thing yeah. like the shots in the dark like it's clearly you know it's too light because it should be pitch i was i was thinking yeah. It, yeah it should be pitch black but it's not a nitpick because it just looks very cool like yeah it's stylistically designed to be that way yeah and the, if you have a problem with that well yeah it's it's a yeah, it's you shouldn't have a problem with it. Just forget about it. It looks very cool, uh, and that's all we need to know. And so, yeah, the bland guy firing his guns in the in the dark. Mm. Yeah, just uh, George Miller just has these ideas. Maybe it's him, or maybe it's someone else. He has these ideas for these crazy shots. So in the morning, Furiosa explains the green place. She recognizes a familiar landmark and shouts out her history to a woman on top. The woman summons her old female clan, who recognize Furiosa as one of their own who was kidnapped as a kid. Furiosa is devastated uh, devastated to learn that the swamp land from the previous night was the green place which is now uninhabitable and there are only seven of the clan left yeah mm. i think it's an interesting concept because i you know watching this movie and this is the second time i watched it watching this movie for the first time i was like are they going to get to the green place eventually you know that's where yeah. they're going to get but yeah it's did it subvert your expectations it does in an interesting way because they're going to this haven but they've already passed it you know it's vanished and they just drove over it that's mm. why again things <laughs> It, it was so wet and uh, the sand was uh, like mud. Yeah, because that's where things used to grow. So it's it's a great moment, I, and I really enjoyed that that twist. If you like, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I do agree. Like the fact that it makes sense why it was a nice place and then it degraded. Uh, I would say there's probably not like I don't think you can say the movie really does anything massively thematic with it. It's kind of just a uh, an interesting idea. Yeah, to yeah. Have them go past it. No, um, I agree. But yeah, yeah. Uh, I would agree with that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it is just an interesting idea. But yeah, in a normal movie, they'd, they'd eventually get to the green place, right? That's where they mm-hmm. try and yes. get to in the end. Insectopia. Okay. So feminism, uh, of course, is another theme that mm. has received academic attention. And I think we should talk about it uh, yeah. here. Because, Wokeness, we call it. Yeah, because, of course, um, Furiosa, she meets uh, the clan and they are, of course, all women. Uh, and yeah, uh, Charlie Theron as Furiosa is the dramatic centre of the film. Like you said before, Michael Mad Max, he has a part to play in this movie. Uh, of course, he you know he's an important character, but Furiosa is like the main character almost. Mm. Like you know, it's it's a toss up between the two. But yeah, um, you know, Furiosa is you know the, the driving force of what happens in this movie, pun intended. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, throughout, Furiosa uh, demonstrates the physicality of a hero committed to a rescue mission that sets up the start of a matriarchy as an antidote to the barbarian warlike tribes that came before. Yes, and, mm. and uh, it's interesting, right? Because of course, you know, these wives are being saved by Furiosa. You know, so that you have this matriarchal element, and the contrast to, of course, Amalton Joe is the ultimate patriarch. 
Yes. Uh, and the, the patriarchy is, you know, <laughs> it's a bunch of like barbarians, uh, like a barbarian death cult. Uh, and that is again the uh, the reality of uh, of, the, of the patriarchy, and yeah, um, in this movie, of course. So yeah, it it is like an incredibly feminist message at, at the end of the day, isn't it? You know, I, I think it kind of makes sense because it's obviously uh, in this world where order's broken down, you'd have this idea of like might makes right, and you know, just being the strongest person. Uh, so I guess you could say that in that they have to kind of more work together. As, as women instead of just having a hierarchy uh, maybe shows that uh, you know this this female essence or whatever is better than uh you know the the man thing where it's this big hierarchy like that's there we go that's my that's my addition to well, it it's also a challenge to the idea of hierarchy i don't think it is the, a challenge to the idea of hierarchy um i think well uh, i give up because what happens at the end of the movie is of course mad max he, oh, yeah, he right. leaves and furiosa is literally elevated along with the women like, yeah, well, what we've got to see is whether or not in, in the sequel, she ends up getting taken well, it's, down. it's a prequel. Oh, is it a prequel? I didn't even know that. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, well, the point is that at the end of the movie, I think that's the, the the defining shot. I think what Judge Miller may have created an incredibly pro-female movie uh, in that, yeah, the what is the antidote to this horrible barbarian like mm. <laughs> society that's been created? We need to elevate females because they will be, again, the antidote to this patriarchal you know male society which is just built on blood death and violence uh and you could say that's you know i don't want to use the word fetishizing women because i think or the phrase because there's a bit better phrase probably but you could say that's the case it's like oh yeah the natural goodness of women will be like w- yeah will be like water in the desert almost to uh to go a bit it, further with the metaphor and, it's almost like the noble savage trope except it's uh women are the savages yeah exactly yeah well but again you can't just always use that trope uh, to, you know, to to explain something, but yeah, it's like there's this natural, you know, goodness about I guess females, which just uh, males again don't display. Uh, and again, like Mad Max, he gets redeemed because he saves a bunch of women, uh, and he spends time with a bunch of women as well. And Nux gets saved because he, you know, he's not a war boy anymore. He, you know, spends time with women. Maybe the first time that's happened. I, I'm not sure, given this society. Uh, and yeah, um, that, that that's what saves him uh, as well. Yeah, uh, hold on. So it's like the white savior trope. Yeah. Are these women saviors. Yeah. Well, and well, yeah. The the natural goodness of the women brushes off on these characters, and indeed on the society in general, and will uh, make society better than how mm. uh, Molson Joe ran it. Um, I guess there'll be no more, you know, uh, slave wives. Uh, <laughs> so that's yes. a, that's a positive at least. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, Again. well, you know what? Maybe the true mother's milk was um, the uh, the mother's, you know, r- ruling over us. Or wait, something. wait, did they call water mother's milk? I thought no, no. I think I mean. So, did you see the whole like? Um, it was only one scene, so I wouldn't blame you if you missed it. But the whole like breast breast yeah, milk yeah, farming yeah. operation. I assume that's what mother's milk is. Yeah, but remember when like Max gets water out of the, out of the uh, rig uh, when he first and she says it's mother's milk. Yeah. So again, it's the implication, like of course, mother, you know, the female form is is water like water to a desert you know yeah, yeah. it's uh, what's the word rejuvenating yeah it rejuvenates the society you know add, add, you know like how water rejuvenates things in the desert well you know in a male dominated society we're adding yeah. some female power and look at this all of a sudden society is better and i yeah. think again this is why it's an incredibly pro female or pro feminist what whichever way you want to look at it uh movie mm. it's inc- yeah, yeah 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 it's that is the message that is the theme if there is a message and a theme and it's incredibly pro feminist which again is uh is, it's funny this movie never gets the backlash other movies with a feminist message get yeah. because again uh i think it was in it came out in the uh, the before times yeah but uh, also i mean there is the fact that it is good you know i don't want to defend the uh the oh no, well, no that's here, but yeah that's another reason why yes you are correct that's another reason why i guess people like say for instance the critical drinker wouldn't you know yes. go at this shots fired <laughs> let's let's try and get his attention hey critical drinker you suck no. wouldn't go at this movie because it's very good and fun uh, mm. So therefore, you can't. Again, the whole idea is wokeness is ruining yeah. movies. But what about Ach, no women ruined me politics? But what about movie? if a m- movie is woke and is also really fucking good? Well, then oh, we can't have that, so we'll just ignore it. Uh, and that yeah. I think is another reason why this movie is ignored. Well, the people like the Crystal or Drinker that Iyer is not directed on this movie, despite its incredibly pro-feminist message. Yes, because it came out in the before times, and also like you said, it's very good. Uh, <laughs> so yes. 
Uh, so obviously at the end, Max, uh, you know, he sees a vision, vision of the child he failed to save. Again, this is the redemption thing. He wants to be redeemed. And yeah, I like the fact that he turns them around. It's a it's a great final act, you know, because you can't really have another chase away from from yeah. you know how do you end the movie? Well, it's still a chase, but it's not really. It's now instead of a chase, it's a race because uh, whoever gets to the canyon first wins. Yeah, yeah. I did have um. See, this could have been a nitpick, but I think it was a bit too um su- su- substantial. Uh, I think I had like two issues with the the final confrontation. The first one is that. Uh, considering the goal was to head them off at the cannon, so it's a canyon. There are like several points where it's pretty clear that the the truck is being slowed down, the rig is being slowed down, and it's like at that point, you know. And I guess you could just explain it by saying, "Well, he's an idiot," but he obviously should have just sent some people ahead. Like there were moments where you could tell that the rig was being slowed down and maybe, they were trying to attack done. it. Maybe yeah. Done. And the other thing is, I was just going to say, I think the um, I I do wish that they weren't quite so outnumbered because I think it did make it, I think it sacrificed realism because, you know, there, there are like a lot of people around them and I'm just like, okay, I guess I'm just supposed to believe that somehow all these other like kind of war-hardened barbarians are just so much worse than this relatively ragtag group of people. And I think generally well, speaking- Well, Furiosa are, and Mad Max are special. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 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 But yeah, there, there are like movies that I think do the um, uh, radically outnumbered trope quite well but they kind of need to in this case i feel like yeah like if it were me i would just say well let's say that there are a decent number of tribes people in furiosa's tribe so nah. the numbers are a bit more even and for me that's just more realistic no, no shut up shut up shut the fuck it's up it's better shut, it's much better shut, infinitely shut, impossibly unimaginably better they are in a war rig as it's called like they are in the vehicle like again it's you know oh, pretty, it's their vehicle it's all about their vehicle it's, eh? it's pretty well defended and of course furiosa is this imperator whatever she's called and she is probably the best lieutenant because you hey you know because she's a woman yeah. in this film and mad max is pretty skilled as well which i guess you'd have to be to survive as long <laughs> as he as he has done uh, so yeah, uh, I think. Yeah. Well, look, I, I saw this really good driving movie, and it taught me that it's not about uh, who is in charge. It's not about who's. It's not about the car. It's about who's behind the wheel. Yes. So uh, again, uh, I, I think the, the final thirty minutes, you know, the, the, the final race to the canyon, you know, you can't point out all the cool shots because there's so many cool shots and moments. Uh, but yeah, it's so creative, inventive, and, and fun. Uh, and yeah, it, it gets really good when there's you know the massive explosion and Max is riding the pole vault. You know, he's riding that thing back up. And then the guitar guy starts playing loudly as you know they all go towards the canyon. It's just like, oh yeah, that's that's great. You know, what what else can you say? Oh, this is really fucking cool. What are, this is why it's special. Like the the, mm. the the spectacle that's been created here is is fantastic. Uh, so as they approach the canyon, Joe gets in front of the rig to slow it, uh, and Max uh, fights Joe's large adult son, Rictus, which I love that phrase. Uh, yes. uh, Furiosa boards Joe's truck to save Toast. That was that's one of the wives. Uh, and the two join forces, enabling Furiosa to kill Joe. Uh, and yeah, obviously, then uh, the surviving brides cross over to Joe's vehicle and Nux sacrifices himself uh, again because, yeah, he has understood now that his character arc is women are the best, so I need to sacrifice myself mm-hmm. to to save the the brides. Uh, and again, yeah, it's it's so well executed all around and and a great ending for that the character of Nux as well, I think. It's a nice end to the character arc. And yeah, um, like when Furiosa rips off Joe's, like, mask or yeah whatever his face his face device you know his bane thing mm. um i think his af- asthma and his inhaler yeah again a perfect way to kill him uh but <laughs> just a perfect ending and yeah obviously max saves furiosa um you know because again he needs to sacrifice himself he, he was a blood bag before he was worthless right yes now he's a blood bag for for women and that's the best thing he can be uh, yes, because <laughs> women have got a lot of bleeding to do. I am being facetious, but yeah, that's that's part of the message. Um, yeah, and of course, back at the Citadel, the people rejoice upon learning of Joe's death, and then as Max's companions are lifted to Joe's cliffside fortress, Max, you know, and Furiosa ex- exchange a glance, which really didn't. I don't think that was needed that glance because it's like we get it. Uh, yeah, I I think like my theory there, like the one thing I think it was supposed to be doing is showing like Mad Max kind of slip away because like I say, his kind of thing is that he like just shows up. Uh, yeah. So I think that that was the point. Like the main point was supposed to be him slipping away, but yeah, was yeah. it weird? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the character, and also he's done his job. He's elevated the women. Mm. He's he's redeemed himself, and so yeah, he's yeah he, now that he doesn't, it wouldn't make sense for him to stay. So yeah, um, Miller described the film's key theme as survival, which he said it has in common with the American westerns, which was such a staple for the better part of the century in American cinema. Uh, several critics wrote that the primary theme of Mad Max is an attempt to retain humanity in the face of apocalyptic events. 
yeah, or an attempt. You could say humanity. You could substitute the word feminin- femininity mm. in there, maybe perhaps. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't think we've explicitly mentioned the fact. That obviously, like uh, they're they're imprisoned as, I guess, br- breeding. Well, yeah, stock? that's 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 part of the patriarchy, isn't it? It's yeah, part yeah, of yeah, the, the, This ultimate like patriarchy. Yeah. yeah so, but I'll, it also yeah. like speaks to the idea of like um, the the world is barren. So you know something going on there with like barren and like rejuvenating life because water rejuvenates. I'm sure there's parallels. Well, I, I just there. I just made that comparison before, like five minutes ago. Oh yeah, yeah, but let's specifically relate. Yeah, okay, fine. Anyway, okay, um, right, yeah. Let's proceed. Con- let's conclude. You go first. Yeah. So uh, I think again, the main thing is this movie is really um, fun, and that's not an easy thing to pull off. Although you know, I, I don't want to let these studio executives off too easy. I think it is kind of an easy thing to pull off, but somehow they still don't manage to do it. Whereas George Miller did, and uh, he did make it exciting, and I think in many ways you could argue that the focus on um, uh, not having that much dialogue and kind of exposition and not really relenting on the action were constraints that he was choosing to work within, and within those constraints he did a really good job. Uh, one of the kind of extensions of that, though, is that there are things that I might otherwise appreciate in a movie, like a kind of deeper thematic exploration, maybe like some more nuanced character moments. Obviously, like we said, uh, Nux, he doesn't really get that much going on. And while I think it's about 50-50 swings and roundabouts between the just pure spectacle world building versus kind of more detailed world building where you can really see the logic of how it fits together, I think both of those can be good. Inevitably, if you go for one, you're going to miss out on the other, which means the movie is inevitably missing out on an aspect there. I'm going to give it a middling seven. Uh, I think that's very fair. If I, I I would give it an eight. I think like one of the, the one things that kind of hold me back also is that it's an experience movie, which I do like, but I think it means that you need to uh, see you, it. you can't really go back to it again and again um in a way of like and appreciate more of it because it's kind of just like the experience there's nothing to kind of intellectually engage okay. with really i think you're being very harsh with a middling eight middling uh, seven i'm oh, sorry middling seven shit because i'm gonna give it a middling eight uh, yeah, yeah. because again like this what this movie tries to do it succeeds 100 percent. again it's special what has been created again it's not my cup of tea in terms of like the, the style but again like i can still of course absolutely enjoy it and it's very good which is why i give it an eight and a half but why it's not a nine or a nine and a half despite it being like almost flawless in terms of what it's trying to do uh mm. but yeah eight and a half out of ten for me and yeah um of course we will predict what furiosa is going to get on rotten tomatoes but just a couple of receipts uh or just one uh, challenges michael uh, that movie yes. you uh, you cheated on. I know you did. Well, I, I found out actually um, that it's by the same guy who did what's it called? Um, yeah. Call me by your right. name. So it's you, like an art film. You absolutely cheated. How, why did you guess ninety two percent? Why I assumed that it would be uh, you know a, a high a high movie uh, because I had confidence in what's her you, face you had, Zendaya. You I no, think she was on an upwards trajectory. I didn't know it was the same guy who directed Call Me by Your Name. I just I, I didn't know that either, but I did know. So, but that somehow Zendaya, somehow you guessed ninety two percent despite not. Knowing. No, it's not. You're not going to tell me. Okay, so just for the record, I still don't know. Oh, you still don't know. Okay. Is it? Is no. If, if you're going to tell me it's on ninety two percent, I swear. Well, it's I not ninety two, but it's 80, okay. It's eighty eight. Okay, that's not that close, but... What do you mean it's not? You're four away. Well, how far... Oh, wait, you guessed like 50. I guessed 67. Okay. Because I, I didn't know it was direct... I didn't know it was going to be, uh, you know, that kind of movie. I just thought, oh, it's a tennis movie, you know, with Zendaya and, the t- you know, two guys are competing for her and it's going to have some, you know, sexual tension going on. Again, it was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be not as yeah. artistic as it ended up apparently being because again it's directed by the guy who made call me yeah. by your see, name see maybe maybe i'm crazy but for me when you said like oh it's gonna have like a threesome in it my brain went to like like nowadays maybe i've just been ruined by all sorts of you know weirdos uh when i think about like weird sex stuff in a movie my brain nowadays unless it's like a, okay. obviously a comedy like american pie i tend to assume it's gonna be a bit artsy all right whatever fucking hell i i i I, I have my suspicions that you knew it was going to be highly rated because the Rotten Tomato score can sometimes come out before we do the review. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's not the case for Furiosa because we're going to predict that now. I've got a number already locked and loaded. What about you, Michael? You got a number for Furiosa? <sighs> Goodness me. Uh, I'll give you three seconds. Okay, am I allowed to? Okay, I just want to know. Because it's up to you. Am I allowed to know what Fury Road got? Like the original got? It was like it, it was like ninety percent. It was it was like nominated for an Oscar, so it's it's going to be okay, good. Yeah, ninety percent. Well, okay, yeah, okay. okay. So right, shall we go? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do it. Three, two, one, eighty-five. Eighty-five. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. I was, I was thinking about going when you said like it got ninety percent. I was going for ninety. I was like, I won't go for ninety because he literally just said ninety. I'll go for eighty-five. Great. Um, I mean, look, if you want it to be more exciting, I'll go, I'll go to ninety. But you know, oh, obviously, you, if you, no, I'm not going to demand you change your pick. It's up to you. I mean, we've got more picks okay. to come this year. So yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, well, no. Okay, I'll stick with eighty-five then. Okay. Just because that's what I originally said. But, right. The good yeah. stuff. So, what are we doing next week, Michael? Yeah. Uh, next week we are doing. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, please. Yeah, well, we're 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 doing another sequel. We're doing Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Yep, because um, of its twenty year anniversary. Yes, twenty year anniversary because of the release of Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban two. Yeah, so join us for that in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, who have you been, Michael? I've been Michael. I've been Luke, and thanks for listening to our Mad Max review. Uh, Mad Max. That is also the nickname of my <laughs> Max Verstappen because uh, he is mad. Um, I I should have said that earlier. Anyway, goodbye. That's oh, okay. I don't I, think I, people. Yeah, I, I it's hate, fine. People will be okay. I hate Max Verstappen. Bye. Bye.